speak about paravelvular leak closure. And it's a very interesting story how I got interested in paravelvular leak closure. Like many important things in medicine, it goes back to the unmet need of a single patient. I recall a patient uh, probably about 15 years ago who presented to our hospital with severe heart failure and a large hole beside her mitral valve. And one of my colleagues said to me, uh, Dr. Rehal, why can't you figure out how to put a plug in there? And that's how the journey started. I started thinking about how we can put plugs in there, how we will develop the techniques, what sort of plugs we will use. And um, as you mentioned, we now have a very large experience of this procedure, and I would like to share this experience with you. Disclosures, everything we do essentially is off-label. We use approved devices here in America. We have a limited number of devices, but it is off-label. Now, the first important point I would like to make about periprosthetic regurgitation is that it is more common than we think. Up to 17% of valves in some series actually have evidence of PVL or paravalvular regurgitation. It can present with hemolysis or heart failure or both. It can be very difficult to treat medically. There's almost nothing we can do medically other than give diuretics. And usually it is underestimated by transthoracic echocardiography. There are many causes for PVL and many risk factors. I've made a list here of some of the more common ones that I've observed, including annular calcification, tissue friability, endocarditis, any chronic inflammatory disorder. The recent uh, institution of corticosteroid therapy, I have seen valves have been just fine for 10 years, and then the patient gets prescribed corticosteroids and all of a sudden the sutures start to pull out. And finally, implantation technique. We know that pledgeted sutures, when the surgeons use them, are associated with less PVL. And so all of these things can conspire to cause paravalvular regurgitation. And we know it can affect any type of prosthetic valve in any position, like this single disc um, uh, tilting valve. Now, anatomically, there are favorable and unfavorable varieties. <clears throat> the top panel shows a relatively discrete PVL around this mitral bioprosthesis, which we can quickly plug, but the lower panel shows a frank dehiscence of the valve, which is not good for percutaneous closure and is likely better treated surgically. I hope the three-dimensional TEE is coming through and now on the transmission, but the real-time 3D TEE has revolutionized our practice because it gives us complete spatial orientation around the valve and allows us to identify where the PVL is and the anatomy of the PVL. So as you can see in the top right quadrant, there's a gap between the sewing ring and the atrial wall indicative of where the sewing ring is. Now, one of the most important things that we learned early was how to visualize these and how to communicate between our echocardiography colleagues who are our eyes and the interventionalists. So this is the view that our echocardiography colleagues typically will use in the operating room. This is the so-called surgeon's view. Looking from above, looking down at the mitral valve, you see the mitral valve is here, tricuspid valve to the right, and this is the view that they are used to using. This is not the view we use in the cath lab. This is the view we use in the cath lab. I call this the interventionalist view. In this view, we're looking up at the mitral valve in our left anterior oblique caudal projection. So the mitral valve is on the right. This is posterior, this is medial, and the aortic valve is to the top left. So you notice this is. 180 degrees flipped. So this is why we never say the leak is at 12 o'clock or three o'clock or six o'clock or nine o'clock. It's because we are in different time zones and we have to use, and we really must use anatomic terminology. So the terminology I would advocate we use to say anterolateral at the base of the left atrial appendage, anteromedial by the aortic valve, 
medial by the interatrial septum or posterior. So we always use anatomic terminology to communicate with our imaging colleagues. There are a number of different configurations of devices that we can use. I believe in Brazil and Europe, you have many more devices that can be used. Um, but here, we tend to use the thin braid uh, AGA devices, particularly the AVP2, because it's very easy to use. It's easy to put multiple plugs and it's malleable, it's soft. The, the, we have the AVP4 as well, but we don't use it very much other than for post-TAVR paravalvular leak. And the AVP3 will be a nice addition and it's currently in clinical trials. We also have access to these, that the AD, ASD occluders, the muscular VSD occluders, and the ductal occluders, but these are thicker braid. These are stiffer devices and residual high velocity jets through the device can cause hemolysis. In our experience, it has been 15 to 20%, which is why we tend to favor the thin braid devices. There are now newer devices like the Oclotec device that are coming and hopefully will be even better for a paravalvular leak closure. Okay, a very common question I get asked is, how do you size plugs for the device? Uh, for, uh, how do you size yeah, the plugs for the defect? So this is a case example. You've seen this already where we have a mitral bioprosthesis and there's a long linear defect by the sewing ring. The first thing I would say is we do not measure the width of this. It's really not helpful. What we measure is a rectangular area that encompasses all of the leak. In this case, let's say this was 12 millimeters by eight millimeters. So we measure from the middle of the sewing ring to the left atrial wall, all right? And then we can cover that entire area with two plugs. So for this particular case, I used it two 10 millimeter devices placed side by side that completely obliterated the leak. So as you can tell, it doesn't matter if this is two millimeters or three millimeters or four millimeters wide, we will never put a four millimeter plug. We will always cover this entire area with one, two, three, or maybe even more plugs as necessary. So this is a case example of a 69 year old man who had had a mitral valve repair with a ring and now came back with this massive jet right there of paravalvular leak. And he came to the catheterization laboratory where we caught this beautiful image with real-time 3D transesophageal. You see the ring, you see the repaired anterior leaflet and right here below it, there's a hole. There's a really, there's an anatomic defect exterior to the ring. So we first catheterized this with a, with a wire and then put a catheter on top of it. And with a TEE, we can immediately tell that we are in the correct position and we're not through the valve. And then through that catheter, I'm putting this AVP2 device. You see we've extruded the distal retention disc. And then as we pull it back, we then release the proximal retention disc, completely sealing off the leak. So in this leak, which was a round defect, a single plug took complete care of it. So this is a relatively straightforward leak as these go. And this is the final anatomic view. You can see the AVP2 device has is, is completely covered the defect. It is not touching the valve. You do not want these plugs to be touching the valve, otherwise the leaflets will deteriorate and de over time. We can also treat multiple defects. This is a patient that came in with severe pulmonary edema into our coronary care unit, and she was found to have multiple uh, defects around her mitral valve. We took her to the cath lab and placed three plugs, and this is a very, very important thing to do, in my opinion. Measure the left atrial pressure through the procedure. So at baseline, the left atrial V wave was 60 millimeters of mercury, six zero. And that's why she had such terrible pulmonary edema. Once we put three plugs in, look at this. The left atrial pressure almost normalized and the V wave is now less than 20. <clears throat> so this patient 
if they're an outpatient, will feel better immediately. That day, they will notice a difference. And if they're intubated in the ICU, we were able to then get her off the ventilator and actually came home, went home a few days later. You can see immediately there was improvement. And with Lasix, we were able to take off the remainder of the fluid. Now, this is a problem that we encountered early in our experience. You can see we're using a muscular device here. We're putting this round device into this linear defect, but there's still a significant gap that is uncovered. And this is how we gradually learned using a single large device is not a good technique. So you can see residual regurgitation around the device can be very problematic. And here is the problem. We're trying to put in a round device into a, into a crescentic defect. And because of that, one device is almost always never adequate unless you have a nice round device. And I've shown you this already, how we actually do the sizing. And here's an example of the simultaneous deployment technique. This is a mitral prosthesis, a TEE probe, pacemaker. We're in the left atrium here with two coronary guiding catheters, two six French guiders. And through the guiders, we are going to be placing plugs. Hopefully this will play. Oh no, it's not playing. Anyways, we place two defect, uh, two plugs into the defect simultaneously such that they completely cover the defect and do not interfere with the normal motion of the tilting disc mechanical prosthesis. So this is an ideal placement for an anterolateral leak. This is the technique that we use most commonly now, and I was discussing with our colleagues why this technique is so good. It's a complex slide, but here's the mitral prosthesis, pacemaker, and we have created an arterial venous rail. So this black line here is a wire that goes through the defect out the aortic valve and then down the descending aorta, and then we pull it out the femoral artery. On top of this wire, we can then place a delivery system like this shuttle catheter. And through the shuttle sheath, the first AVP2 device is going in. We place the first device, then remove the shuttle sheath, leaving the first device on the cable. And then on the top right, you can see we have gone back in on top of the arterial venous rail and placed a second AVP2. And then we've done it a third time. And here they are after release. So using the arterial venous rail technique, we can very quickly place one, two, three, four plugs in a matter of a few minutes and then assess the result. Until the very end, everything is reversible. Like even after placing three plugs, if we're not happy with it, either from the uh, efficacy standpoint in the sense that we have failed to reduce the regurgitation adequately or the safety standpoint in the sense that we are interfering with the mitral prosthesis, we can remove these plugs. So everything is completely reversible till the very end. And so now this is our preferred technique for complex mitral paravalvular leak closure. Okay, what about aortic PVL uh, uh, closure? We have developed, and others use as well, of course, very analogous techniques where we go retrograde up the aorta, pointing down to the valve. We place a wire through the defect, followed by a, a catheter. Then through the catheter, we can place a plug. We can even leave a wire in the left ventricle that we term an anchor wire, so we can go back in and do multiple plugs. I would like to draw your attention to the fact that the grading of aortic paravalvular leak is extremely challenging. And the reason it's challenging is that color flow Doppler can be very misleading. Even a small aortic paravalvular leak can have a big color splash because of what we call the garden hose effect. Like putting your thumb on the end of a water hose, you can get a high velocity jet that creates a tremendous color splash even if it's low volume. So that's only one aspect of grading for aortic paravalvular leak. We also look in hemodynamics like this, the Sinning Index developed by Dr. Sinning, where one looks at the fall and decay uh, 
of the diastolic blood pressure and tries to relate it to the left ventricular EDP. The lower the diastolic blood pressure and the higher the LV EDP, the worse the aortic regurgitation, of course. So this is a case example of when we've come back retrograde through the aorta, we've cannulated the defect, it's beside this mechanical prosthesis and there's a mitral mechanical prosthesis. And now we're releasing the proximal part. You can see this AVP2 is nicely conformed to the left ventricular outflow tract. The actual defect, it fills in the defect and the proximal retention disc is below the left main coronary artery. And these procedures are greatly facilitated by the use of computed tomography CT scanning beforehand. We, take, we do CT analysis, particularly for all of our aortic leaks, less so for mitrals, but for aortics we do, and then we spend a lot of time analyzing these scans and identifying the actual defects. So here you can see on the posterior aspect of this mechanical aortic prosthesis, there's this C-shaped, G-shaped defect, and here it is angiographically, it looks identical. So we set up the camera angles to match the CT angle, and then we can quickly cannulate it and quickly plug it, as you can see, as we have done here. This is with a small mechanical device. Okay, post-TAVR paravelvular leak used to be more common. With the, with the newer generation of devices, it's now rare to, to have moderate or severe, severe paravelvular leak following a TAVR procedure. But this was our typical approach. This is with a sapien prosthesis. We put a safety wire through the valve just in case we move it or dislodge it. We don't want it to embolize. So we put a safety wire through the valve. Then we cannulate the leak. And in this case, it's looped back out the aortic valve, and then we can put a catheter over top of the wire. And then through that catheter, we go ahead and place, in this case, an AVP4 device. The other thing I would caution is we must be ready to remove what we put in. So this is an example of where a device embolized. The good news is they typically do not embolize to the carotid arteries and almost always get lodged in the common iliac right at the site of the aortic bifurcation. So structural operators who are doing these procedures must be ready to be able to remove these devices like we did here, goes right back in. So using snares to create AV rails or to remove plugs that have embolized is very important. Now, how do these patients do? We have, have published a large number of papers on this procedure looking at outcomes, and I would like to make some important points. The first thing is, and this is from our practice by my colleague, Dr. Al Cooley, that optimizing the procedure by reducing the residual leak to almost zero is the goal. The lower you can make the residual leak, the better your patient will do. So in this example, as you can see, out to 100 days or a few years, four years, if patients had only mild residual paravelvular leak, they actually did very well in terms of rehospitalizations or repeat procedures. But if they had moderate, then of course, they'll need many more procedures, including redo surgery. As I've already mentioned, measuring the left atrial pressure is an important hemodynamic correlate of success. So we really feel that if the final left atrial pressure, okay, can be reduced to less than 30% of the mean blood pressure, these patients will do quite well from a survival standpoint and from a rehospitalization standpoint. But if their left atrial pressure remains elevated, they will be back. And sometimes a pressure will remain elevated if the left atrium is stiff and non-compliant, and then we can't do much about that. So just to reiterate, our goal is to place the plugs precisely in position and to have no regurgitation if possible. There's a big learning curve with this procedure. Of all the structural procedures that I do, TAVR, mitral clips, left atrial appendage closure, et cetera, et cetera. These are by far the most complex procedures. And as you can see, the procedural time gradually fell from almost three hours 
in the first 50 cases. And now we can reliably close even the most complex mitral paravalvular leak in about an hour. So there's an important learning curve. Similarly, the rate of adverse cardiac events has fallen significantly with experience. It's now down about 4%. And most of those adverse events are actually bleeding events. And so we have to be very careful with anticoagulation management. So I tell my patients that now the chance of having a successful and uncomplicated procedure in experienced hands is about 90%. So we think that's a reasonable number for such a complex structural heart procedure. There have been many outcome data. This is a meta-analysis uh, produced by my friends and colleagues in Canada. And what they showed is that with successful paravalvular leak closure, cardiac mortality is reduced, functional class is improved, and the need for repeat surgery goes down markedly. So these procedures do work and to provide significant benefit to a very high risk and a very complex cohort of patients. So what can we conclude? Number one, paravalvular leak is relatively common and underdiagnosed. Two, endovascular or percutaneous closure is feasible but there's a significant learning curve for new operators. Three, residual regurgitation is the key determinant of outcome, so procedural optimization is very important. Four, paravalvular leak closure improves symptoms, hemolysis, lowers the need for subsequent surgery, and is associated with lower mortality. Very important patient benefits.